I want to introduce you to Professor Eugene Kontorovich. Dr. Kontorovich comes from where my father came from, which was Kiev originally, uh, or his family. You were born. He was born there. Uh, he is a remarkable individual. Uh, what he's written here, as far as what I would like to say, uh, he's professor of law at George Mason Law School, but you're the Scalia Professor of Law, correct? It's called the Scalia Law School. The Sc oh, okay, the Scalia Law School. And he's also founding director of its Center for International Law in the Middle East. So it's actually a Center for International Law in the Middle East, a new academic initiative designed to broaden the discussion about legal issues pertaining to the Arab-Israeli conflict. There are few people who are as knowledgeable as Professor Kondorovich when it comes to these issues and the legal issues involved. And I am certainly looking forward to hearing what he has to say. After he has spoken, we will sit up here. I'll interview him just for about 20 minutes. And then, of course, we will open up the floor to questions. If anyone is interested in dining with us this evening, please get a hold of me uh, before the event is over. And we're happy to have you join us. Thank you. Professor Eugene Kantorovich. Uh, I want to thank Alan and uh, the Chabad JCC for having me out here. Uh, I have to say I'm really sorry to be here today because I would much rather be here at any of the other amazing events you guys have coming up the rest of the summer. Uh, I'm going to miss uh, some, of, some of these speakers are my friends and uh, I recommend them all and I wish I could be here to uh, hear them also. Uh, so our topic, uh, our topic today uh, is one that I think is both long-standing of long-standing interest and uh, of extraordinary contemporary relevance. Uh, the question is about the potential annexation of the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, by Israel. Uh, and I think the talk is called, uh, Why Israel Does Not Need to Annex the West Bank. Does that mean it should? Does that mean it shouldn't? So uh, we'll see, and I think I will explain, that it is actually impossible for Israel to annex the West Bank. It's actually impossible for Israel to annex the West Bank. Whoever wins the elections in Israel, whatever the outcome of the diplomatic process being uh, orchestrated by the United States, I can guarantee you that the West Bank will not be annexed. And I will explain in my comments why that is the case. Uh, Judea and Samaria will not and cannot be annexed by uh, Israel as a matter of international law. But the basic question must begin, let's take a step back. Around the world, there are dozens, maybe more, of major territorial disputes. India and Pakistan over Kashmir, uh, Turkey and Cyprus over northern Cyprus, Russia and Ukraine over Crimea, Korea and South, North, South Korea and North Korea over all of Korea. And sometimes the newspapers write about these conflicts. Not often, but you'll sometimes hear something about Northern Cyprus. Not so often about Nagorno-Karabakh or Western Sahara. But the discussions, both in diplomacy and in the press, of these conflicts is not couched in legal terminology. That is to say, there's a conflict between Turkey and Cyprus over northern Cyprus. It's not put in legal terms. There is no conflict that is as ubiquitously put in legal terms as the Israeli-Arab conflict. This is a conflict where all discussion is framed through legal terms of art. So occupation, for example. Occupation is a legal term of art. It is a specific legal status that arises out of the Geneva Convention. Right? It's not a colloquial term. And you often hear Israel's illegal occupation, the illegality of settlements. Every issue involved in this geopolitical conflict is put in legal terms. Uh, unlike 
any other conflict. Um, and just to give you, just to give you a taste of this, occupation is a legal term. It's a status under the Geneva Conventions. The United Nations has used the term occupation in relation to Israel in resolutions since 1967, 2,400 roughly times. It has used that term in relation to all other conflicts and occupations around the world since then, more than half a dozen, about 16 times in total. So there is no conflict that is cast in legal terms as much. And that's a problem, because most of us are not international lawyers. Even some of the international lawyers might not be international lawyers. So how do we assess what are really legal claims? And typically, discussions of these issues don't give you the tools to do that. So for example, they'll just say, Israel's occupation, which is illegal under international law. That's two legal claims right there, that there is an occupation and that it's illegal. How do you begin to assess this? Or they'll say that the international community regards as illegal. Also does not give you a tool to assess it. Because I'll say right now, there's a whole big question, and I spend the first three weeks of my international law class discussing this, so we can't do it justice here. What is international law? Is it really law? Where does it come from? There's no international legislature. It's an interesting question which deserves uh, some attention. But one thing that is not international law is what countries happen to think. That is to say, a consensus amongst countries does not produce international law. International law, to put it differently, is not a popularity contest. So votes at the General Assembly do not themselves create international law. If international law were, you know, a popularity contest, an episode of Survivor, Israel and the United States for that matter, would have been voted off the island many decades ago, that's not a source of international law. So we're, we're gonna discuss now what are the borders of Israel under binding sources, binding concepts of international law? Uh, and to start with, I'm gonna make a methodological point. There are many, many legal issues, international legal issues related to Israel. Uh, and I cannot do them all, I can't address them all here. But what I'd like to do is give you some tools to begin to think about themselves critically yourselves when you're reading the New York Times, you're listening to NPR, the BBC, you hear legal claims. And I want to give you some methodological guidance. And the basic tool is this. So I know you all came here to hear about Israel. Uh, for the next 20 minutes, you might not hear so much about Israel. Because how does one figure out what international law is as it applies to a particular case? The same way you would figure out what any other law is, you look at the precedents. You see what rules are applied in other similar cases. This is not how international law is typically applied in the case of Israel. When there's a question about Israel, what is the status of the West Bank, for example, the typical reaction is to look at what everyone has said about the status of the West Bank itself. So that is like a judge in a case trying to decide the case by looking at earlier things he said about the case, not about what other judges have said about other similar cases. So if you're faced with any question about Israel and international law, the first thing to do is say, show me how this works, show me where this works in a similar situation involving countries not called Israel. Give me some examples. Right? If there's a rule like this, if it's a rule, what's the characteristic of a rule? It's general and is applied to like similar cases. If it's only applied to one country, it's not international and it's not law. So the basic minimum criteria for international law. Show us where it's applied. So you need to know things to be able to assess claims about Israel and international law. You need to know things about other situations. You need to know things about Nagorno Karabakh and about East Timor. Problem is most people don't care about those because um, they're not Israel. Uh, and so what has been created in international law is what I would call a legal ghetto, a universe of I would say custom-made and bespoke 
legal principles which only apply to one case, which govern one case, which are self-referential and build on each other. And the goal of my center for international law in the Middle East is to break through the walls of that ghetto and say, if it's international law as applied to Israel, it has to be international law internationally. Otherwise, it's not worth speaking of. So here I'm going to start with a very good and simple example. What is the status of the West Bank? As we know, the West Bank came under Israel's control in the Six-Day War in 1967. What is its sovereign status? What is its sovereign status? And here, we can start with, uh, we have to go back to 1948, when Israel was created. And the question is, what are the borders of the State of Israel when it is created? State of Israel comes into being, how do we know? What are its borders? And here we are in luck, because there is an international law rule, which you're not going to hear me say this often, but it's true in this case, is simple, easily applied, and universally and consistently applied to determine the borders of new countries. There's an international law rule for new countries. It's a, and it's a rule that's applied across the globe. It's a rule that's been applied by international courts, by arbitral tribunals. It is a universally agreed upon principle. You don't get that often, by the way. So we're lucky in this case. Why is there an international rule for the determination of borders of new countries? Because new countries are created fairly frequently. There were about 50 or 60 members of the United Nations when it was created. There's 193 now. So the situation is regularly occurring. Israel is not the world's only new country. And it is also quite common that the borders of a new country are going to be contested by its neighbors. If you don't have a simple, algorithmic, clearly applied law, rule to determine the borders of a new country, there will be constant conflict over its borders. And that's bad. So as it happens, there is a rule. There is a rule. Now, what is that rule? The rule, it has a Latin name called Uti Potidetis Juris. In international law, they try to name things in Latin or French to make them less accessible uh, to lay people uh, so that you have to go to other people's lectures. Uh, and, but the rule is very simple. The rule says that if a new country is created where there was not previously a separate country, as opposed to a situation of a change of governments within a country, when a new country is created, either because of the disintegration of an empire, decolonization, secession, cession, any other reason a new country may come into being, its borders are the borders of the last top-level administrative unit in the territory. The borders are the borders of the last top-level administrative unit in the territory. Period. Period. That's, 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 the, that's the test. So let me give you some examples to help uh, illustrate what this means. So for example, take uh, Crimea, as Vladimir Putin did in 2014. Uh, the international community regards Crimea as being Ukrainian sovereign territory occupied by the Russian Federation. Why is that the case? We hear often about self-determination. Is it because of self-determination? Because uh, the people in Crimea would prefer to be part of Ukraine? No, really, quite to the contrary. Most of them would almost certainly prefer to be part of Russia. Not 95%, like they said in their election, but you know, that's the only number that comes out of Russian ballot machines. But uh, certainly a sizable majority prefer uh, Russian sovereignty. And indeed, most of the people are ethnically Russian. It has historically been part of Russia. And the way it came to be part of uh, Ukraine was very strange and what we would call undemocratic. It was part of the Russian Empire and then the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic for hundreds of years. And then Nikita Khrushchev, the head of the Soviet Union, the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Politburo, just redrew the borders of the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic to give Crimea to Ukraine as a gift. So the Soviet Union was made of 16 top-level administrative units, Soviet Socialist Republics, like American states. And he just redrew the internal borders. No self-determination, didn't ask anyone, didn't check with the Crimeans, didn't check with the Russians. And nobody really noticed or cared because everybody was still governed from the Kremlin. Comes the 90s, Soviet Union collapses. Ukraine declares independence, Russia declares independence. What are the borders of Ukraine upon its independence? The borders are exactly the borders of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. 
Now you could say, no fares. He didn't ask the Crimeans. What about self-determination? They don't want it. It's undemocratic, doesn't matter. Because this principle for drawing borders of countries trumps all other principles. Why? Well, we'll, we'll, I'll say why in a second. Uh, let's go through a few more examples. So the Yugoslav uh, Federation collapses. What are the borders of the new countries? Again, the borders of the previous Yugoslav units. Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic, and so forth and so forth. Uh, when international courts are trying to determine border disputes between Latin American countries, they dig up 15th century, 16th century Spanish maps to see what the administrative divisions were between the Spanish governorships. African borders are drawn this way. Now, as we know, before the creation of the State of Israel, the territory was a mandate. It was a League of Nations mandatory territory called the Mandate for Palestine. So does this rule work for mandates? Absolutely. And again, it's important to know most educated people, unless they take a special interest in Israel, will never have heard of a League of Nations mandate in their life. Uh, people who might take a particular interest in Israel may have heard of the Mandate for Palestine. In fact, there were dozens of League of Nations mandates around the world. So we can learn a lot about the Mandate of Palestine from these other mandates. And one need not look far. Lebanon was a mandate. Jordan was a mandatory territory. Syria was a mandatory territory. And Iraq, then called Mesopotamia, were mandatory territories. What all of these countries, the mandates, have some features in common with the mandate for Palestine. Namely, so famously we know that many people thought that mandatory Palestine should be split in two to create different countries for ethnic, ethnic groups, to be partitioned on ethnic lines. But mandatory Palestine was not the only mandate to lump together a majority of one ethnic or religious group and a minority of another. That was actually the case in Iraq with the Kurds, in Lebanon with the Muslims, and in Syria with the Druze and the Sunni and pretty much everyone. Uh, in all of these cases, there were major arguments and major initiatives for partition, to create a Kurdish state, to, create, uh, to put the Muslims in Lebanon back of Syria, uh, Syria itself was partitioned many different ways by the French during the mandatory period. These were not the world. However, what are the borders of all of these countries? In the end, their borders are the borders of the, mandate, of the mandate at the moment of independence. And nobody would accept the argument that those borders should be revised in light of previous, in light of arguments during the mandate or because the mandate was not fair. That is to say, all of the mandates were unfair in some sense. None of them involved democratic processes. And I'll give you examples of the very few situations in which someone has suggested that a mandatory territory, that the borders be revised because the mandatory borders were not the ideal ones, uh, and what the reaction of the international community was. And uh, uh, there are two major examples. When Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, he didn't just invade it Stam, he didn't just invade it just because. Right? He was not like some TV bad guy who does things just because he was bad. Iraq had long-standing claims on Kuwaiti territory, which are not without their equitable bases. Iraq said, what, what, what determines Iraq's southern border with Kuwait? It was the border of mandatory Mesopotamia, mandatory Iraq, drawn by the British. And they say, like the Palestinians now, why should we be bound by these old League of Na Nations borders? Right? Mandate, shmandate. Who cares about that? It's not fair. After all, Iraq has tens of millions of people and has a very short coastline. Kuwait has very few people and has a water coastline. It's not fair. International community soundly rejected Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in an attempt to redraw those borders. When uh, Papa Assad invaded Lebanon in the 70s and 80s, he didn't do it just because. He had a long-standing claim. Lebanon had been part of Syria until the mandate. He said, why should I be governed? Why should Syria's borders be governed by the mandate? Not fair. The international community soundly rejected Syria's claims to Lebanon. So there's a pattern here. There's a pattern. 
And of course, there's an exception. There's an exception. President Obama, many others, say that Israel's borders should be the borders of the so-called 1967 borders, not a very accurate term, the 1949 armistice lines, not the borders of mandatory Palestine. That argument, for some reason, gets some traction, but the legal analysis is the same. The, the board, uh, mandatory borders become, at the time of independence become the borders of the new countries, and this is, and it trumps all contrary considerations, such as self-determination, historic title, uh, demographic considerations, topographic considerations. Why? Because political borders never coincide perfectly with demographic borders. All countries have ethnic groups spread across political frontiers, and if you're trying to make ethnically perfect borders, you're gonna have to do violence to pre-existing political borders in ways that inevitably result in significant conflict. So we see this rule is clear, it's consistently applied, uh, and let me address maybe some uh, con potential contrary considerations. So one, month, one might say, some special pleading. Maybe, though, this should not be the case with Israel because of UN General Assembly Resolution 181, adopted in November 1947, which called for the partition of mandatory Palestine into six weird triangles that don't touch, each, three of which would form a Jewish state and three of which would form an Arab state. They did not call it a Palestinian state at the time. Uh, and Jerusalem and the area around it would be a international city that they called a corpus separatum. Um, so maybe that means we shouldn't go by the mandatory borders. And I, this is a very important point to stress because even many strong supporters of Israel often have a misguided view that the resolution of the United Nations in uh, 1947 created Israel. Uh, that this was Israel's birth certificate, as some people call it. Uh, that it gave legitimacy to it, the creation of the State of Israel. So this is exactly wrong for many reasons. Uh, first of all, the, the international legal basis for the State of Israel comes from the League of Nations mandate, adopted in 1922 by the League of Nations, which called for the creation of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Why did they call for the creation of a Jewish national home? Importantly, they called for the reconstitution of a Jewish national home. What's that mean? They said, the Jews are going to get a country in this area, not because we feel bad for them and they should have a country, but because they're from there. They had a country there. They're reconstituting it. So that, if you need a legal basis, that is the legal basis. In 1947, what the UN did, it tried to do, or suggested to do, is to back down on that promise and say, well, maybe they can only have a, a Jewish home in a small part of that territory, in part of that territory. But it is not important for our purposes. Why? Because General Assembly resolutions have absolutely no power. They're not binding, because uh, nobody who's joined the United Nations has agreed. The UN, why, is it, why are General Assembly resolutions not binding? Because what creates the General Assembly? The UN Charter. That's the Constitution of the UN. And the UN Charter makes clear that the General Assembly is not competent to take any binding action whatsoever other than approve its own budget, which it does very well and very generously. Uh, and the UN in 1947 knew this. They knew this. Because if you actually read the text of the resolution, what's it say? It says, we recommend that the mandatory power split this mandate into two, into two, after it had already been split to create Jordan. It was a wreck, and with the UN resolutions, the most important thing, you know, is always the verb, right? So for example, they could say, you know, strongly condemning Syrian use of chemical weapons, or condemning in the most strong possible, horrible terms, the building of Jewish homes in Judea and Samaria. So the verbs are where the action is. Here the verb was recommending. It was a suggestion to the British. And the British said, they looked at the map, they said, no, thank you. And that's the end of the story. So the Utipadadetis principle does not go based on suggestions. Right? That is to say, the borders of a new country are the borders of the top level political administrative unit at the time of independence, not the borders 
that someone suggested should be the borders of the top level political unit at the time of independence. That there is no precedent for such a principle. Uh, and in general, the continued insistence on Resolution 181 having any relevance is an extraordinary example of uh, the odd approach the international community takes to uh, Israel, where a non-binding resolution that was never implemented and has long become moot, and which the UN would not have a power to make binding even if they tried, is thought to establish permanent boundaries and permanent baselines. Just by way of counterexample, whoever speaks of UN Security Resolution 16, I'll, I'll tell nobody, it's a trick question, uh, which created a permanent international free city of Trieste. Real thing. This was, not the, this was not the General Assembly, this was the Security Council. So like Jerusalem was supposed to be an international city, this was a popular idea back then. Trieste, which is like um, on the Yugoslav-Italian frontier, was, was created as an international city, a permanent international city. And uh, then a few years later, Yugoslavia and Italy partitioned it amongst themselves in complete violation of the terms of the Security Council resolution. Does anybody ever question the borders of Italy or what is now Slovenia and Croatia? It's moot, it's moot. So there is this idea, which I think needs to be greatly resisted, that the United Nations is somehow has a, a, a paternalistic or parental relationship with Israel. That the United Nations brought Israel into being and thus has some kind of filial power, right? parental control over Israel. It is not the case. Uh, the only thing the United Nations tried to do was limit the territory in which Israel could come into being. Um, you might ask, how did Israel come into being, if not by the United Nations? Israel came into being the way most countries come into being. Themselves, they came through their own deeds and action by winning the War of Independence. If Israel had not won the War of Independence, which the United Nations, uh, I would say, did a lot to help them not win, uh, Israel would not have come into being, and that would be the end of the story. So, again, that resolution does not change the application of the Utipotidetis principle. Now, what about the armistice in 1949? So as soon as Israel was created, it was immediately invaded by all of its Arab neighbors and some of their friends. They managed to occupy much of the territory of mandatory Palestine. In particular, what was Gaza and what was then known as Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria was occupied by Jordan. And they occupied it from 1949 to 1967. Israel and Jordan signed an armistice agreement, which is uh, basically kind of mild ceasefire. And Jordan occupied this area for 19 years. That does not change Israel's underlying sovereign rights to the territory. Why? A couple of reasons. First of all, the application of this borders rule is, it goes by, it's called the birthday principle. You apply this rule to figure out the borders of a new country at the moment of its birth. Right, so you know like when a baby is born, the doctor takes it and puts on a special baby scale. So this is a special rule for figuring out the borders of a new country. You need to know its borders, like you need to know how much a baby weighs. You figure that out immediately. Obviously a rule that says we determine the borders of a new country six months after it is created would give great incentive to neighbors to do exactly what Jordan did and try to break off a piece for themselves. So the fact that Jordan occupied parts of this territory doesn't matter because Israel already had sovereign claim to it. If, on the other hand, you can say that Jordan's conquest of this territory, that Jordan's uh, occupation of this territory, did, for some reason, confer legal rights to Jordan, then all is still good. You get to the same position, because if you can take control and change sovereign rights in this territory by conquest, then when Israel retook the territory in 1967, it was, again, either taking territory to which it had claim, or if this territory was up for grabs, then just as Jordan could take it. The same would presumably apply for Israel, presumably. Uh, minor, except, again, remember the legal ghetto, uh, if there is not a legal ghetto. So when Israel takes this territory in 1967, uh, it is taking either territory to which it had sovereignty or uh, to which it had as good a claim, at least, 
as, as Jordan. So what's that mean? That means that Israel has sovereign title or claim to what we would call Eastern Jerusalem and all of what is known as the West Bank. So Israel has chosen to fully and robustly exercise these powers with regards to um, Jerusalem in a very obvious way. But uh, I should say the fact that Israel has not fully applied Israeli civil law to the West Bank should not be taken as a waiver of sovereign claims. That is to say, people say, oh, well, West Bank is different. It's not part of Israel because it's under a different regime. That is to say, it's under military, it's under a kind of loose form of military rule. That's true, but that actually has nothing to do with sovereignty. That is to say, the, the, form, of, uh, the form in which government is provided is different from the existence of sovereignty. As we know, many, all US territories were governed in, when they were territories under a different form of government than US states, often under a military government. Much of Israel itself was under a military government until 1965. Many countries were under military government for many parts of the history. That does not mean they don't have sovereignty over their territory. Sovereignty and the form of government are really different questions. So now we get to the uh, title of the talk. What's annexation mean? Annexation means when a country takes for itself and claims as its own territory that is not its own. Territory that is not its own. That's what annexation is. If Israel, the, the political discussion in Israel currently is about applying Israeli civil law to uh, what's known under the Oslo Agreements as Area C, which is basically the area in which all the Jewish communities are and a small percentage of the Arab population is. It's not annexation because annexation means you're taking what is already, what is somebody else's. It is simply changing the form in which government is provided into what I would say would be a more fair and equitable manner to territory to which you have a legal claim. I should contrast this, by the way, with the situation in the Golan Heights. Everything I said so far applies to the West Bank, Jerusalem, but it does not apply to the Golan Heights. If you were to ask anyone in, uh, in May 1967, who does the West Bank belong to, they would not say it belongs to Jordan. They would say, it's up for grabs, it's disputed. Um, I know because I actually went and there's a very interesting exercise sometimes to do. In retrospect, when everybody knows who wins and loses, it's easy to change the rules to fit your outcome. So today, so the question is, who did people think the West Bank belonged to in 1966? All right, today, we know it's occupied Palestinian territory, according to the Europeans, according to the UN. But before Israel took control, who did it belong to? So you have to go and ask people in 1966. And uh, there's a very amazing device for doing that called the library. And you can go and you can look at books from 1966 and say, how did they discuss this? And typically, they listed the West Bank along with Kashmir, the Korean Peninsula, as one of these post-war, up for grabs, fly balls, where the uh, sovereignty remains unclear and there remains to be a dispute. So it only became clear that it was uh, not Israel's or that it was Palestinian uh, when the winner of the Six Day War became, uh, became known. Uh, so this is not true of the Golan. If you were to ask anyone in 1967 who does the Golan Heights belong to, the answer would be quite clear. It was Syrian territory. That's undisputed. That's undisputed. So when Israel took the Golan and then applied Israeli law to the Golan, it was in fact annexing the Golan. Now I believe Israel had substantial legal grounds for doing that. Uh, in particular, the rule against taking territory in war only applies or was created to apply to situations of illegal war, aggressive war. So the United Nations Charter bans aggression, which means attacking other countries. But it does not ban all war. That would be crazy. So the United Nations Charter explicitly permits self-defense in Article 52. So war and self-defense is legal. 
if the underlying wall is legal, it's not clear that the corollary that you cannot... So th the idea of not being allowed to take territory in an aggressive war is that if you can't steal, if you can't break into someone's house, you shouldn't be able to keep the things that you take. But if the underlying use of force is not illegal, then that corollary drops out, and indeed it would seem if you cannot acquire territory in a defensive war, there is no negative sanction for aggressors. That is to say, you think you're, you're, you're a Syrian dictator, and you think, let's start a war. What do we have to lose? Well, if we win, nobody's going to, you know, the international community is not going to do much about it, and we get some territory. If we lose, we break even because they have to give back anything they take. So that seems to be a license or a subsidy to uh, aggression. But it is quite clear, nonetheless, so Israel may have a legal justification for its annexation of the West Bank, but it needs to be made clear that that is a different legal justification from Judea and Samaria, which is, a, I would say, a much stronger legal justification, a much clearer one, um, and it does involve an annexation. Uh, you'll see, I should also make this clear, uh, the papers here, I understand, I'm very surprised when I read what's in the papers here. Uh, I saw a headline in a major American paper, said, Prime Minister Netanyahu says he may annex the West Bank if he's re-elected. Um, so other than the words Prime Minister Netanyahu, no part of that headline is accurate. Uh, he did not say he would annex it. The Hebrew word for annex is sepuch, uh, a word which uh, the Prime Minister does, does not use. Uh, he talked about applying Israeli civil law to this territory. And he didn't call it the West Bank, he called it Judea and Samaria. Otherwise, the headline is largely accurate. Um, the, and on the question of applying Israeli law, it's important to point out that this should be something that unites people of many disparate views. Because one of the things Israel is most criticized for in its administration of Area C in the West Bank, people sometimes say there's two different systems, two different legal systems for two different populations. And of course that is because the Palestinians living in Area C, they're, they're relatively few in number, are not Israeli nationals, are not Israeli citizens. And because there is this odd form of government, this military government. So two forms of government. So great, that's, I mean, that doesn't sound great. I mean, that sounds like a problem. So how do you fix it? By having one form of government that applies to everyone, Israeli law, with an option for citizenship for the Palestinians there, just like in Jerusalem. But interestingly, those who criticize Israel for its current administration of the territory uh, would not be gratified or in any way ameliorated if Israel adopted one form of government as it has in Jerusalem. Uh, so I think that objection is a little bit pretextual. Uh, okay, so that is, that, is, that is the legal status of the West Bank. A few things come out of it that are quite important. Um, there is no occupation. Occupation is a situation that arises when an army takes control of foreign or hostile territory and puts it under its own administration and administers the government. You obviously cannot occupy your own territory. Right? You cannot self-occupy. Uh, another thing that comes out of it is there is no question about the legality of uh, what Jason Greenblatt recently controversially called cities and towns, Jewish cities and towns in the West Bank, uh, often known as settlements. Interesting story we can tell about why they're called settlements. Uh, but these Jewish communities, which are often discussed as a violation of international law, it's a whole separate story where that legal argument comes from. But I should say, uh, it comes from the Geneva Conventions, the fourth Geneva Conventions. And the fourth Geneva Conventions only apply in a situation of occupation. And if there's no occupation, you don't even open up the fourth Geneva Conventions to see what they say. And the argument about settlements, which I think is a weak one, even on the terms of the Geneva Conventions, uh, becomes moot. So, uh, let me see how much time. Okay, uh, time for questions. Uh, so. Whichever, I, I think what has become clear, we've seen a couple things. We've seen, most broadly, I think most importantly, to know the international law about Israel, you need to know the international law about other places. To begin to understand international law as a, uh, that's going to apply to Israel, it's best to see how these rules apply in other situations. 
and this is what my center hopes to do, this is what, my, what much of my research hopes to do, to take scholars who are writing about Nagorno-Karabakh, who are writing about Western Sahara, and see what international law actually is as it applies in these cases. Now, sometimes people will say to me, you know, just because the international law got it wrong nine times out of 10, doesn't mean we shouldn't be happy when it finally gets it right in the case of Israel. But that is not how law works. We rule by the majority. And I should say, if, if, you, if you have nine cases going one way and one case going the other, and you know nothing else, you have a strong basis to say that those nine represent the accurate situation. But if you know that that one case is Israel, where the uh, sentiment of the international community is so passionate, uh, and I would say disproportionate, uh, you would have added reason to think that that one, uh, one case does not represent the, uh, accurate, uh, the accurate rule. And this could be applied to numerous other legal questions. You need to first see what the international was before you get to Israel, which is, of course, the most emotional, the most uh, passionate, the most volatile context. Uh, and ha know what your rule is before you know the case that you're going to uh, apply it to. Okay, uh, I look forward to our discussion, Alan. Should we move the, Should we move the podium? Should we move it so people can see us? Or? We'll stand or sit? Or? Thank you. Ah, it's on. You Do I have a seat here. Do you want to sit? Yeah. Will they see us? We're going to have to move the podium. I hope you enjoyed that discussion, that talk as much as I did. When you hear so much from so many different sources, and then you have an expert in international law who can try to explain it, it comes out very differently from what we commonly hear and read. And that's why this is so important and why we wanted to have Professor Kantorovich come and talk with us. By the way, there are many of you who are bundled up because it's chilly in here. For the last five years, it's been too hot here. So we're going to find the best middle ground. These two wonderful air conditioners that we added this past year, uh, and we promise it won't be too cold all the time. Now, before we open up the floor to questions, there are a number of things I'd like to ask Professor Kondorovic. Uh, the first being the practicalities in Israel right now. The wonderful parliamentary system that I feel absolutely poisons countries uh, because in order to form a majority, often you have to sell your soul to little teeny parties to get one, two, three, or four, or five more votes in a place like the parliament or the Knesset in this case. Tell us what you think about the possibly upcoming elections, unless somehow it is altered, and what is going on in this country? Uh, so there was, uh, the Israeli parliamentary system is uh, deficient in a great number of uh, ways. Uh, and uh, as with maybe democracy itself, as Winston Churchill put it, uh, you know, the, maybe its only saving grace is that other possible remedies would be worse. Uh, there was an attempt to reform the Israeli system in the 1990s to allow for the direct election of the prime minister. This was uh, Netanyahu's first term, actually. Uh, and that also was thought to work very poorly, and they changed it. Uh, so the, uh, you need to put together a coalition. Other countries sometimes have problems with this also. Belgium couldn't do it for years. Uh, Italy often has problems. Spain has problems. But uh, right now, this is not about substance in any significant way. Uh, it's about numerous parties trying to gain leverage for themselves uh, and uh, I think the results of the election are going to be very similar to the results of the last election. As a matter of fact, we just had the world's most accurate poll of the Israeli population, the election, two months ago. Uh, 
uh, which was itself you know, very indicative of, and nothing is going to happen between one election and the next, other than parties reforming and uh, reshuffling themselves. So it's mostly internal competition for uh, influence and leadership rather than any substantive disputes. So the election outcome is going to be very similar to the last election outcome. That raises one major concern. If it's exactly similar to the last election outcome, then that means there will be potentially a third election, uh, which would be too much. Uh, so there is a real also possibility of a national unity government between the Likud and Kohol uh, Vulavan, uh, the major opposition party, which together would almost be enough to uh, form a coalition by themselves without smaller parties. That may have a great appeal, but it all depends on the exact numbers. You mentioned something earlier about Avigdor Lieberman and his party, which consists mostly of Russian Jews who've come to Israel. And you mentioned that a lot of these Russian Jews, there's no way they're going to vote a second time. Tell me about that. So one common understanding of what happened in the last election, uh, Avigdor Lieberman, who heads uh, the Russian Immigrant Party, made his demands for Haredi conscription principally known after the elections during coalition uh, negotiations, which is an odd time to begin insisting on principles uh, when you're negotiating. This was not a major theme of his campaign. Um, this party was created to cater to the very large number of Russian immigrants who came en masse in, in the 90s. Uh, they were a significant and cohesive sector of society. They needed particular services as a large group. Uh, that sector is only getting smaller right, because the new uh, Russians, the people born or who've grown up in Israel, uh, they don't see themselves in, as immigrants. They're fairly well assimilated to society. They don't need immigrant benefits and services. And the people who actually came are either you know, quite assimilated already themselves or much older. Uh, and uh, so their numbers are fairly capped. Uh, this is not a self-perpetuating population, which is a good thing. Right? I think it's good not to have self-perpetuating subgroups uh, catering for special interests. But Lieberman needs to find a way to break through his sort of natural ceiling of uh, largely elderly Russian immigrant voters. So he's trying to link up to broader issues like Haredi conscription. But it is unlikely that many people think he's very sincere. Polls are showing him do better, but um, one big question is turnout. So there has never been a case in Israel where you have one election three months after the last one. And the question of, is who's going to be bothered to come twice in three months is probably going to be what's actually going to determine a fairly close outcome. Ironically, the Haredim, I think, are going to come in much higher numbers than before. Because what they did, they did when the election was held, the Haredi draft was not the central issue in the election. It was not even a major issue in the election. So they did not necessarily vote or come out, out to vote based on that. Now that they know that this is the major issue, they will probably come out in larger numbers. One of the major efforts that you have personally been involved in uh, came to the fore again this past week in Congress uh, when there was a bill that was introduced that was voted uh, and, and accepted uh, about BDS. Now, BDS to us is well known. But to many people, and we found this out when we had Ann Bayevsky here two years ago, to many people, BDS is just something they hear, but they don't fully understand. BDS is boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It is a cultural and academic and economic boycott, if you would, of the state of Israel in order to bring down, if you would, the state of Israel. What you have done has been on a state level, and I would like you to talk to us about your efforts, which have been, thank God, very successful, and also what you think about the group that tried to form a coalition against this and use terms like we boycotted the Nazis, so why can't we boycott the Israelis? Okay. Uh, so, f first of all, uh, 
I myself am not a big fan of using the term BDS. It's almost inevitable because it's gained such great currency. But as with other terms, West Bank, which was a Jordanian term, described to use the uh, territory on the other side of the Jordan River, it, it's not our term. It's a term that uh, the proponents of boycotts, uh, boycotting Israel came up with. Uh, it's their marketing. It's their term. And uh, I think there's a reason they like it. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement makes it seem like a broad, grassroots, popular movement, uh, rather than something fostered by a small number of gov European uh, government-funded NGOs. Uh, so I'm not sure the language is good. And it kind of hides what it's about, right? Because boycotts, what's a boycott mean? Boycott of the state of Israel. Doesn't sound so bad to many people. But what, the, what this campaign is calling for is discrimination. Right? It's calling for what we would commonly call discrimination. So let's say you have a business that says, we're not going to cater to homosexuals. We're not serving homosexuals here. And someone complains. They say, oh, we're not discriminating. We're just boycotting. Right? We boycotted Nazi Germany. Why can't we boycott anyone else? And I said, that's discrimination. You're not doing business with people because of their affiliation with a trait or group. And what, the, what this movement is seeking is to prevent and pressure companies to not do business, not just with the state of Israel. Uh, the companies that are targeted by boycott activists, they're not you know, taking defense contracts with the Israeli government. They're doing business with Israeli people, with Israeli companies. And they're being pressured to not do business with people solely because they are Israeli, or they do business in Israel, or they have a relationship with Israel. And that's not boycotting, that's discrimination. Right? So we're not saying we're not doing government business with the government of Israel. No one would care about that. So we're not doing business with Israelis, with people with a connection with Israel, not because of what they did, but because of their connection. So in response to this campaign of discrimination, there has been a fairly extraordinary development over the last four years, uh, which I have had the honor to be uh, very deeply involved in, uh, 27 American states have adopted uh, laws that treat refusing to do business with people on the grounds of their Israeliness or Israeli affiliation the same way as other forms of discrimination. So these states have determined that this is a form of bigotry. It's a proxy for bigotry. It's a proxy for discrimination. Uh, and it doesn't matter what your motives are. It doesn't matter what your motives are, whether you're pressured into it, whether you have ideological beliefs, whether you're just trying to cater to customers. J just like over 20 states have laws saying, you're free to do business with whoever you want. But if you don't do business with people because of their sexual orientation, you're not eligible for government contracts. So now 27 states have laws that are exactly the same, except also for discrimination based on Israeli affiliation. Uh, and that's because they see this also as a form of invidious discrimination, which while it's legal, and these laws do not seek to ban it, it doesn't stop anyone from boycotting Israel, it doesn't prevent anyone from engaging in this discrimination, but it says, just like President Obama said, when he signed a national executive order, barring the federal government from contracting with people, with companies that discriminate on the grounds of sexual orientation, just because you're discriminating doesn't mean the government taxpayer dollars have to be used to subsidize what the government regards as discriminatory activity. And that's what these laws in 27 states do. The interesting part of this, um, while they're very much modeled on existing anti-discrimination laws for other groups, the ACLU, which was the biggest proponent of the existing state and federal measures saying that uh, governments need not contract, with companies that uh, boycott, shall we say, uh, people on the basis of the sexual orientation, is now the leader of the campaign opposing the same principle as applied to Israeliness. So they seek to exclude the Jewish state and those affiliated with it from the benefits of standard anti-discrimination protections. Of course, that's shocking. And you look at SodaStream, one of the largest businesses in the West Bank, and with BDS, uh, they took jobs away from hundreds of Palestinians. Uh, 
it just uh, mention. I, I have to say, it's often said as a criticism of the boycott movement that it will also hurt Palestinians, Palestinians will lose jobs, uh, Israeli businesses in Judea and Samaria are amongst the largest uh, employers of Palestinians and they pay far better than any other available uh, jobs. Um, I never found, th I don't think that argument is ultimately going to be compelling on a uh, international scale because that argument, you know, we, we tell ourselves that, but um, it's only persuasive if the purpose of this campaign is to help Palestinians. Uh, I see no evidence of that. If the purpose is, you know, if the purpose is to hurt Israelis, the collateral damage, the pointing out the collateral damage to the Palestinians is not going to uh, change anybody's mind. When the present administration moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in response to the law that was passed by Congress in the mid 90s, and in response to every president since that law was passed who said they were going to make this move but did not. So when the present administration did make this move, uh, many in the Jewish community were very upset because it would inflame Israel's enemies. It would inflame the Arab communities around the world, which would make it much more difficult. Uh, this is... It, it kind of goes back to the our forefathers and mothers who came here from overseas and said, shh, don't talk too loud because they'll get angry with us. As it turns out, the response, the angry response and the, the, all the, the trouble was nothing. Talk to that, if you would, and then segue into the quote deal of the century and what your thoughts are about the outcome of that. Uh, first of all, I want to say one of the best jobs uh, in the world, um, if you have kids, you're thinking what they should do, what they should study in college, um, being a, a Middle East expert or an international relations expert is one of the best jobs in the world. Um, you can be nothing but wrong for many decades uh, and uh, continue to be gainfully employed. Uh, so, one of the most robust predictions. Yeah, this Ross. One, one of the most robust predictions about the move of the embassy to Jerusalem is that it, uh, it would set the Arab street aflame, that it would lead to attacks on American diplomatic targets around the world. We could not secure such a broad perimeter. Every American around the world is going to be a, a, t uh, a target. Uh, so that, that was the prediction. And I think this prediction is indeed symptomatic of a, of a broader disconnect in the current diplomatic understanding of the Middle East. The Jerusalem Embassy Act was adopted in 1996 during the Oslo process. Uh, and the, when uh, President Trump uh, surprised everyone by actually seriously taking what the law says, and it was clear he was going to make a serious effort to actually recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and move the embassy there, uh, everyone was very surprised. Nobody was nobody was going to had been taking this law very seriously for a few decades. So what they did was they dusted off the arguments that were made against this law over 20 years ago. And if you look at the arguments made against moving the embassy originally, why they put in the national security waiver originally, because it would inflame the Arab world. Uh, and those arguments may have had some more weight 25 years ago, but. They're empirical arguments, they're factual arguments. And one should be always very suspicious if factual arguments don't change, fact-based arguments don't change when facts change, when circumstances change. And the Arab world of today is not the Arab world of before. It's been fundamentally realigned uh, in reaction to the existential threat posed by Persian Shia uh, imperialism. That is an existential threat. What they feel about Jerusalem you know, may be a third order preference, but Saudi Arabia is now fighting an actual ground war against Iranian forces who are lobbing missiles into Saudi territory. It's a matter of life and death for them. Um, and in this sense, the Iranian nuclear deal, which greatly empowered Iran and gave it a lot of money, made this threat even more real. And uh, I would say after President Trump 
tore up the Iranian nuclear deal, you know, if he, forget recognized Jerusalem, if he laid the cornerstone for the Third Temple, the Saudis would still make him man of the year so long as he maintained a hard line about Iran because one is a matter of life and death and the other ma is, a, is a matter of, um, say, path-dependent tastes. So the, the interest in this conflict has greatly abated. And in general, the entire Oslo paradigm, the two-state paradigm, the, all of the dominant notions about peace in the Middle East which we accept today as being written in stone, I think it's important to point out that they arose in a very unique historical moment, in this very, very special, I would say, golden hour between the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of both uh, Iranian imperialism uh, and uh, Sunni Islamic uh, extremism as major trans-border political movements. So what happens in the Middle East is part of broader trends. What happens in Israel and the West Bank are part of broader trends. So the, the entire history up until 1990 was determined by the Cold War. The Arab countries and the Palestinians were Soviet clients, were Soviet allies, and that entirely determined their politics. Um, it, was a, it was a proxy part of the Cold War. Then the Soviet Union collapsed, and everyone was so happy. History was over. We're going to have a European Union that was going to grow bigger and bigger. And uh, it was going to be like a John Lennon song, and everyone was going to you know, make peace. Uh, Imagine. And, th and then history reemerged. Uh, history reemerged. Uh, religious extremism reemerged. Uh, Iranian imperialism reemerged. And those trends now are also driving the Middle East. And the, 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 our paradigm was crafted at a sort of very special coffee break between you know, two rounds of, uh, of history. Uh, but we have not updated our paradigms, I think, to reflect the new times. The deal of the century. Uh, yeah, so um, the deal of the century. I read somewhere that it's not clear that uh, the president ever used those words. Uh, but uh, I think the administration would very much like to uh, make a peace deal uh, between Israel and the uh, Palestinian Authority. Um, I think the administration. Uh, has, I think its deal uh, has exactly the same chances as all previous efforts. Uh, and I think it's going to be vastly criticized for its, um, if it fails. Uh, and I think it should be uh, considered in light of the success. And when people criticize the, uh, when the, when the plan is presented, if it does not succeed, which I think is reasonably likely, uh, many are going to criticize it as saying, oh, that's because uh, you didn't do X and you didn't Y and you didn't do Z. X, Y, and Z being characteristics of past efforts which have also failed. Uh, and the notion that there is what's called a bargaining range, a middle zone where both parties consider themselves better off, that they can agree to, and it's only some kind of aberrational irrationality that has kept them from making a deal that is in their mutual best interest, um, I, I don't see any reason to think that. I think it uh, condescends to both the Israelis and the Palestinians. You know, one, what one often hears from uh, think tanks in Washington, uh, foreign policy think tanks, is that everyone knows what the solution is. But those everyones seem to not include the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, and I would say one reason the status quo is the status quo by definition is because both parties have repeatedly chosen it over all other conceivable alternatives. So I think the status quo is actually quite robust and it's going to be hard to change. Um, at, the, at the same time, I think it's important to point out that when the Palestinians say no, it's important to, to, it's important to see what, it's important to put that in context. And I think here's some relevant context. I described this in some more detail in a Wall Street Journal op-ed a few years ago. Uh, there are many national independence movements around the world, hundreds or thousands, depending on your count, ethnic secessionist movements, groups that are engaged in uh, political demands to create a country of their own. N almost none of them are ever offered a country. That's an exceedingly rare circumstance. Many ask, almost none are offered. Of those offered, which national independence movement has ever turned down 
a sovereign, independent, fully recognized state. That is to say, the Palestinians wouldn't have to be like Kosovo in some kind of waiting period limbo, you know, pending full international acceptance. They would go straight to full international acceptance the moment they sign a deal. Who has ever said no because they don't get all the territory they want? Israel didn't in 1947 when they said that we would accept the UN's very ridiculous deal that did not include Jerusalem. By the way, America didn't in 1776 when they declared independence and ultimately signed a peace treaty with Britain that left all of its northern border and northern claims entirely unresolved. Who has ever said no because they don't get all the territory they want? Um, again, it's very hard to say this scientifically because so few national independence movements are ever offered a state to say no to. Right? The denominator is very small. But to say no to a state is an extraordinary thing. To say no not once, but two times, three times, four times, to you know, paraphrase a book that was popular about a decade ago, one might think you know, they're just not that into us, or they're not so into the idea of peace, or they're not so into the idea of statehood. Um, there's an idea in economics called revealed preferences, that we as social scientists should not sort of um, assume or uh, assume what the preferences of consumers and economic actors are, you have to infer the pr uh, pr uh, preferences of consumers from their market behavior. In other words, how do you know what people want to buy? Look at what they buy. So how do you know what a group wants? Look at what they continue to choose time and time uh, again. And I think at some point it's important, and I hope this point is going to happen in the very coming years, that uh, the Palestinians are, have to accept consequences of their choices. Because so far, and I think this has been what's wrong with all of the past phases of the peace process, two states, it's a nice idea maybe, okay, it's an idea, the, but w why has it not been achieved? At least one basic reason is that one key dynamic of all rounds of negotiation is that whatever the Palestinians say no to in one round of negotiation becomes the floor for future rounds of negotiations. Oh, we have to start at the Clinton pr parameters. We have to start at these parameters. We have to start at the Obama parameters. The Palestinians gain nothing by saying no. They just raise the price. That makes it very rational. Of course they should say no. Now, if the dynamic were set opposite, every time you say no, you shrink what you can get. That actually creates an incentive to come to the table. And that requires a fundamentally different paradigm. Well, I'd like to open up the floor to questions. I will carry the microphone around. But first, because often when we finish questions from the audience, fewer people are left. I would like to formally thank Professor Kantorovich for these wonderful remarks. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We know the demographics. And if there were one state, for instance, Israel would disappear. Or the Jewish state of Israel would disappear. Probably all the Jews. Uh, talking to a taxi driver in Jerusalem a few months ago, he told me about his problem. Of, he was born in East Jerusalem, and he uh, raised his family. The kid went to medical school in Germany. Wonderful story. But he can't travel because he has a Jordanian passport, and he can't get an Israeli passport, and he and he doesn't he he's stuck, and it seems I was thinking that there should be in the solution, and I want to know what you think about this. If the if the Jordanians would create a new type of passport call it the Jerusalem passport for any uh, uh, of the Arabs who don't have to be Israeli citizens, but they have special status in the state of Israel. Could you talk about that, please? OK, so I, I don't know the uh, particular circumstances of a taxi driver. Uh, I can say um, East Jerusalem Arabs are eligible for Israeli citizenship, uh, most of them due to political pressures exerted on them by the Palestinian Authority have chosen not to opt for it, though increasing numbers are. So I, I don't know his personal circumstances, but 
they can choose Israeli citizenship. They have largely chosen not to have it. Uh, it's interesting that he has a Jordanian passport. Not all of them have that. So I don't know why he can't travel, because you can travel on a Jordanian passport. It's a real country. Um, maybe you can't travel to as many places as on an Israeli passport, but I think that would be true if there was a Palestinian state. I don't think the state of Palestine passport will get you into as many places uh, as, the state of, uh, as the state of Israel passport. Um, so, but a, a notion that, um, and I was talking about this with Alan uh, before, the, before the talk, uh, Jordan clearly has some responsibility in this matter. Uh, Jordan occupied this territory for 19 years. For many years, uh, many of the uh, Arabs in the area were Jordanian citizens. But the notion that some Jordan... Would, some would say Jordan is Palestine. So Jordan has a majority Palestinian population, certainly. But the notion that Jordan will in take any political actions to help solve this problem, I think, is fairly far-fetched. Uh, Jordan does not want responsibility for more Palestinians. It is already a uh, minority Bedouin government perched on a large and uh, not always happy Palestinian population. Even giving pal uh, some kind of semi-passport, I think, would uh, not be uh, consistent with their interests. And uh, it's not clear why Jordan would want to help Israel in this matter. Again, that assumes that Jordan's Israel interest is in helping the Palestinians rather than weakening and undermining its, uh, its neighbor. Uh, so I don't know why they would want to, to do that. If I, if I was an advisor to the King of Jordan, I would not tell him to do that. It's interesting, even in the United States, up until last year, you couldn't be born in Jerusalem, Israel. That's still the case, by the way. The uh, State Department hasn't changed their policy yet. My question relates to the person who was in uh, negotiating for the United States now, the president's son-in-law. How is that viewed by the parties and other people in the in the area that have the interest in this, and whether or not there is uh, whether he's ha he gets the support that's necessary if you're going to be a negotiator on a serious problem? Uh, okay, so I have not consulted with uh, all of the parties to get their views. Uh, I can tell you the Palestinians are not interested in these negotiations not because they're being conducted by Jared Kushner, but because they don't like the baseline parameters of these negotiations. They believe, and you know, I think this is the danger of putting these arguments in legal terms, they believe anything other than the territory occupied by Jordan in 1949, plus a few other goodies, is, uh, you know, is inadequate, because that is what they have been told that they deserve, and that is what they have been told that they can hope to one day get. So anything that, you know, and I think this was one of the major mistakes of the Obama administration to say that the negotiations were based on the so-called 67 lines. So they're not interested in hearing anything else. And I don't think it's really important who the messenger is. Uh, I think in dealing with other countries in the region, uh, Mr. Kushner is very authoritative. Because when you have a diplomat, what's very important is what authority does he have? What authority does he carry? And obviously he carries some formal authority, some formal credentials, but what influence does he have back home? So someone who is known to have considerable influence with the principal on, on whose behalf he is negotiating, someone who can actually make sure that the deals he proposes get carried out, uh, is going to have a extraordinary, uh, is, uh, be taken extraordinary seriously. And I think that's why in the Gulf states, where I think everyone is somebody's son-in-law, uh, who's involved in this, uh, they, t they, uh, they don't take this amiss. Uh, given your description of the current legal status, what would you suggest should be done? And if the answer is nothing, how will the situation evolve in your opinion? Uh, yeah, so nothing, by the way, is always a good start. Uh, there, I know there are some doctors in the room. How many doctors do we have? In so first, do no harm. Right? That's, and I think that is a principle that can very be usefully imported from medicine into uh, diplomacy. Currently, Israel is in the most secure, stable, and prosperous moment of Jewish history in at least 2,200 years. So historically, this is the best there is. Uh, cross, uh, let's say, geographically, cross-sectionally, uh, 
the situation in Israel is the most stable, peaceful situation from Tunisia very far to very far. Uh, so geographically, historically, things could be a lot worse. So I think one major criteria for uh, evaluating suggestions is don't make things worse. And it's easy, it's much, it seems much easier, there's much more downside, there's much, many more ways to get worse than to get better. Uh, at the same time, the current situation could be improved. Uh, I think the situation in which the Jewish communities in uh, Judea and Samaria are uh, under a different system of rule, uh, which inhibits their growth, which also doesn't, uh, it makes life a bit more difficult for the Palestinians living there, um, is not stable, is not ideal. Uh, and I think regularizing the status of these communities and fully applying Israeli law is an, important, uh, is an important start, and I think also not a very big step to make. It's been done for Jerusalem, and I think it could productively be done for, uh, let's say, at least parts of those areas placed under Israeli jurisdiction under area by the Oslo Accords. But I don't think there's a diplomatic way forward. Uh, I think they would evolve much as they're evolving. How would things evolve under that scenario? So that's a very good question, because any suggestion, we have to then see what happens next. And I think um, many of the, I think one of the big problems with the traditional two-state paradigm is it, uh, that question, what happens next, is often not posed to what happens if a mortar is launched from the new Palestinian state onto Ben-Gurion Airport, and everyone gets on the next airplane out of Israel, and then you have a real demographic problem. So the, what happens next is a serious question. Um, I think it would allow Israel to, currently, there's a re, one of the main reasons that the international community, I think, there are many reasons, but one reason the international community seems to prefer to pressure Israel over the Palestinians is Israel has a big pressure me sign, big kick me sign on it. Israel seems like the easier mark. Israel is the party that says, maybe we'll give up, maybe we won't give up, and the Palestinians say, we're not giving anything. We have a red line. No, 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 no. So the international community uh, the, uh, puts pressure on that side, which seems more easily pressured. So a clear statement of the permanence of Israel's interests, I think, strengthens its hand in any future diplomatic situation. Also, it would allow Israel to control what has become a very problematic situation. Uh, the Oslo Accords and the division of authority between the Palestinian Authority and Israel were based on demographic considerations, right? So Jews under Israeli control, Arabs under Palestinian control, but demographics is not static. And in an organized campaign led by the Palestinian Authority, subsidized by European countries, Palestinians are moving in significant numbers from Palestinian-controlled areas to the supposedly uh, apartheid Israeli areas, uh, and in ways that are changing demographics in a way that might make any of the previously suggested, even diplomatic solutions, impossible. So to fully control that, Israel needs to regularize the status of these areas in a way to make the in, uh, enforcement against these efforts uh, more streamlined. Um, could you please comment about why the press is so down on settlements? When we had a chance to visit Nevyakov not too long ago, it's just a, 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 a suburb of Jerusalem filled with um, young, right-wing, ultra-Orthodox Haredi families with 15 kids. There, there's no violence. There's no military around there. It's just another suburb. But yet, when you read about it in the newspaper, you think these are places where the next war is going to start on the Palestinians. Why is it that way? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, the discussion of settlements, I think, is... There's a lot of reasons, I think, because I think there's a lot of um, claims made about them, which are, I think, I inaccurate, but very provocative. One claim is that they're illegal under international law, so we just discussed that claim. Another is that they are built on land stolen from the Palestinians, which is interesting because Palestinians do own land, they have private property like anyone else, but it seems every single settlement is built on stolen Palestinian land. They must own a lot of property, which is quite extraordinary because you know we're out west here. You know, even today in the United States, after like a hundred years of you know parcelization, two thirds of the land in the United States is owned by federal or state government. So this notion that every single square meter of land, wherever, wherever a Jew builds a home, 
happens to be stolen power state, what are the chances? Um, I, so that's one argument. And another argument uh, is that there are barrier obstacles to peace. I think that's another, that's one. Look, they're gonna make a two-state solution impossible. So first of all, I think there are many other things that may make a two-state solution impossible, like the apparent disinterest in the Palestinian Authority in a two-state solution, but one question, it only makes a two-state solution impossible if the premise is that a Palestinian state must begin free of Jews, that you cannot have Palestinian state with Jews. Why else would it make a two-state solution impossible? Israel has a 20% Arab majority. If every single Jew in Judea and Samaria stayed in a Palestinian state, it would have much smaller Jewish population. So then people say, oh, but you know, they will, you know they'd all get killed. It would be impossible for them to stay. Well, that doesn't sound like a peace deal in, that, in those circumstances. Well, they wouldn't want to stay because it would be very bad for them. That doesn't sound like a very nice arrangement. Why should it have to be bad for them? But it's quite clear that Abbas insists that his country begin with no Jews. And that's an extraordinarily illiberal demand. And I think we need to do a better job at translating these terms. Right? Settlements are a problem is another way of saying the Palestinians want a territory that is pre-cleansed of Jews. They want a country without an ethnic minority. And that's an extraordinary thing for them to want to do themselves. It's even more extraordinary for them to insist that Israel pre-cleanse it on their behalf. What are the uh, implications of citizenship, Israeli citizenship, for people now living under Palestinian rule? in terms of um, the discussions usually in the press revolve around phrases like apartheid. Uh, so I think the apartheid accusation is based on a model in which Israel would uh, fully apply its sovereignty to these territories and permanently bar the uh, Arab residents from citizenship. Uh, that is not a suggestion that is under a very serious political discussion in Israel. Uh, the more serious political discussions involve uh, the application of Israeli law to parts of Judea and Samaria, which uh, would presumably, based on prior precedents in Jerusalem and the Golan, uh, offer the option of citizenship to the Arab residents there. And in line with that question, we frequently hear, especially in the Western media, about the population time bomb that is happening in Israel, that if it was a one-state solution, the Arabs would overtake the Jews and it would be awful. Caroline Glick paints a very, very different picture. And in fact, the birth rate among Jews, especially religious Jews, is far higher than the declining birth rate of the Arab population. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think demographic trends are very hard to forecast. Uh, it is true that uh, the Arab uh, population is growing at a decreasing uh, rate of growth, uh, as is happening to most peoples around the world. Um, this is a prediction that has been predicted for so long that uh, it's notable that it has yet to come true. Um, it's a serious question. It's a serious question of some dispute. It's an empirical question. Uh, but also it's very hard to predict future events based on current trends, especially because we don't really understand many of these trends. So you mentioned religious Jews in Israel. What's particularly notable about Israel is that it has a high level of fertility amongst the secular Jewish population, by far the highest in the West. And that rate has been quite stable now for a number of decades. Uh, that is a very hard thing to explain because it's not seen anywhere else in the world, so we don't really know why it's happening. But it is, it, it's clearly a puzzle, demographically. So we don't know why it happens, so we don't know if it's gonna last or will grow or change. Uh, but so, you know, the demographic issue is complicated. But I, I do wanna say that there's another side to this demographic issue that I, I think if one is concerned about these things, and I, I'm not saying one should be or one's right to, or I don't know if a one-state solution is bad, but if one is concerned about these things, uh, then one should understand that the drawing of a political border does not freeze demographic phenomenon. I think if one thing we have, again, the, this Oslo paradigm has not been updated to meet 
uh, new factual circumstances. I think if there's one lesson that we can learn from Europe in the past several years, the United States today, is that political borders are, no long, are not demographic borders. And migration and demographic flows are today transborder. It is almost impossible to prevent transborder population flows. And certainly Israel uh, would not be in a good position to, uh, to prevent it. Um, I, I think, uh, I don't know, are people saying that they would support Israel building a wall to prevent uh, pop uh, population migration? I don't think so. So I don't know why one would think that the drawing of an imaginary line would freeze any kind of demographic processes. We'll take one last question, uh, and then please feel free to uh, speak with Professor Kondorovich uh, in person up front after. Last question. Your <clears throat> explanation of the mandate issue and how it should apply to international borders was very, very interesting. But what would be the counter argument from someone sitting up there who was being um, true to what they believe in legal terms to what you said? You know, I love that question. I, I told Alan before the talk that I'm 100% likely to get this question. Uh, it, this is an interesting question because I, I get this, I think, every time I speak. Uh, which is, it sounds good, but what's the other side say? Um, and that's interesting, because I really wonder when the other side, whoever they are, uh, give their speeches if they get that same question. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, I haven't seen that. But um, So listen, uh, you have to ask them to, I think, uh, really do them justice. Obviously, uh, I don't think they have a great argument. Otherwise, I'd be making it myself. Uh, but to the extent I've heard it, it's, I would say, an argument from uh, consensus and authority. That is to say, this argument isn't right because everyone's already agreed it's wrong. So you could say the United Nations voted in this resolution, and that resolution, and this resolution, that Israel uh, is not allowed to uh, have any title, that Israel doesn't have title to this territory, and all the legal experts say, so it's wrong because we've agreed it's wrong. But that, of course, is principally an appeal to authority and consensus, and I think is somewhat circular. But the question is, if you go back to first principles, why is this position right? And that's where I try to reason from, because I believe no amount of United Nations resolutions can override generally applicable international law. Thank you very much, everybody. Yes, you go.